Welcome to Empire State Engagements. I'm Dr. Robert Childs. I spoke with the photographer and historian Marissa Scheinfeld about her wonderfully sensitive and evocative book, The Borscht Belt, revisiting the remains of America's Jewish vacation land. We spoke about memory, about ruins, about history, and about renewal. When people kept saying there's nothing there, I was like, no, like these places are alive. You know, and we think of ruins as kind of inert or like dead, but they're not, you know, and these are modern ruins in America. You know, mostly we think of ruins as thousands of years old where we have to go to, you know, the Middle East and Tibet and far off places. But these are like sitting right here and um, they can tell us a lot. They're obviously melancholy. And I think there's a huge pathos that runs through the project. But I also believe that they're kind of instructive and um, romantic at the same time. Welcome to Empire State Engagements. I am ecstatic to be joined today by Marissa Scheinfeld. Marissa is a photographer, artist, archaeologist, historian, and lecturer whose work explores embedded histories within the landscape and, I would argue, inspires viewers to do the same. She is currently visiting assistant professor of photography at State University of New York Purchase. Professor Scheinfeld's work has appeared in a panoply of publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Slate Tablet, the Village Voice, the Jerusalem Post, American Photography, and the Jewish Daily Forward. And her projects are among the collections of many institutions, including the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, Yeshiva University Museum, the National Yiddish Book Center, the University of California's Magnus Collection, the Simon Weisenthal Center, and the Museum of Photographic Arts in San Diego. Her first book, uh, The Borscht Belt, Revisiting the Remains of America's uh, Jewish Vacation Land was published in 2016 by our dear friends at the Cornell University Press. And I am really excited to have the chance to talk to Marissa about this fantastic work. So welcome, Marissa. Well, thank you so much for having me and inviting me on this uh, podcast. I've been looking forward to it. Well, it's, it's great to have you. Um, and it was wonderful, as I told you uh, many years ago, I had the opportunity to hear you talk about your work at Researching New York, and I've been enthusiastic about it ever since, and so I'm glad to, to dig even more deeply today. So you write that you initially set about in 2010 to capture what remained from the golden era to create an archive. As we'll discuss a bit moving forward, your project evolved swiftly and became much more than that. But let's start with a sense for the history, the context of what you were going to end up documenting. Tell me and tell our viewers about the Borscht Belt, about the golden era. Give us a sense for the, the energy, the joy, the escapism, the play, what this place meant in its heyday to the many people who were enjoying it. 
Yeah, well, the Borscht Belt was for American Jews, I'd say, from the 1920s up until the late 60s, but even moving into the 80s and 90s did many of the hotels still remain. But for this, you know, 50-year time period, it was a destination for American Jews, not only to go and vacation and relax. Um, it forged social connections. It was a big cultural hub. There was music, there was entertainment. But the real thing that's really interesting and also sad about the Borscht Belt was why it was created. It was created because Jews in America in the 1920s were banned from going to hotels, certain restaurants, um, even certain places of employment. There's a lot of anti-Semitic lingo and actions and behavior. And I think Jews, just like any other group, wanted to enjoy that American dream. And that American dream has always been changing and we could even question if it still exists. But at that time, it was to live peacefully without persecution. And I think enjoy um, that American lifestyle, which is besides work and hard work, it's a vacation. But being banned from going to vacation areas, they created their own. So um, that kind of creation was, you know, it was a Mecca, it was a hub where they just gravitated to um, for a very long time, bringing their families and meeting people and friends. And I think because of how joyful that moment was for Jewish history and American Jews, especially coming off the tail of World War II, which it kind of coincided with a big boom in the 50s in the Borscht Belt, um, it really has still been and will always be such a cherished era because of the joy um, that people found there. It's wonderful. And, and you get a sense at times uh, in your work of, of the joy that had been, um, which we can talk more about. In fact, uh, you, you point out it, it is, it, it's such a, a sad sort of origin story and yet such a beautiful and joyful and exuberant uh, place. And, and that, that, that sort of dichotomy within the history is really fascinating. You, you point out that, uh, in your words, the small society fashioned in the Catskills region embraced Jewish history and tradition while adopting a modern desire for acculturation into the wider culture and participation in a middle-class standard of living, which sort of ties into that post-war uh, moment especially. These events uh, helped to mold the identity of post-war Jewish American life, which in turn influenced contemporary American culture. And I'm interested if you can talk about the profound cultural footprint of the Bush Belt, which really lasts up to the present. Yeah, it, it, it is deep, like the roots of a tree. And I think a lot of people aren't even aware how much Jewish culture has contributed to American culture, um, not only with basic things like food and sustenance, but with entertainment. Um, you know, the Catskills and the Borscht Belt is known to be the birthplace of stand-up comedy. So I think it's there where we can begin, where you have these names, um, you know, Mel Brooks, um, uh, the, the controversial name of Woody Allen, um, Joan Rivers, Jerry Seinfeld, um, and those are just some of the big names, but there's so many other huge names for their day. Um, you know, Rodney Dangerfield and Freddie Roman, and there's the famous Henny Youngman, um, you know, so many comedians who honed their jokes on Catskill stages and told their worst jokes were laughed off, were fired from Borscht Belt resorts only to graduate to American television and mainstream movies. Um, so the comedy influence is huge, as is the start of so many bands who were the opener acts for, um, you know, unknown bands. For example, I was once told a story that someone was on the way to the Raleigh, which was a hotel in um, Monticello. They were on the way to the Raleigh and the opener canceled. And they said that someone at a gas station told them the fill-in band was Led Zeppelin. And no one, everyone was like, who's Led Zeppelin? So it just kind of shows, you know, <laughs> I've seen all these like The Who, Jethro Tull, um, uh, you know, Fleetwood Mac, they were big then. But, you know, even in like the early 60s, you know, the rise of musicians 
um, comedians, which we touched on. Um, and then I think later on the movies where you can just say these kind of dirty dancing, um, you know, uh, Mr. Saturday Night with Billy Crystal and how that is just like Hollywoodized version of this experience. Interesting. I, I read uh, very recently that you knew uh, very well the, the woman who inspired uh, one of those, I think Dirty Dancing, right? Yeah, Jackie Horner, the late Jackie Horner, who was married to a man who was very instrumental in Gross Singers too, named Lou Simon Says Goldstein. He was like the MC or like the DJ, but of that day, uh, the Yiddish word for him would be a tumbler. And they were just the excited, um, really just colorful people that would get the guests to just participate and get excited about, you know, being in this space and just, again, the joy. Um, so I was able to become friends with Jackie um, for many years. She passed just before um, March, 2020. She passed in February, 2020. But um, her life story, um, not completely autobiographical, but in many ways, the people she met and her experiences shaped um, the writing that the screenplay um, writer for Dirty Dancing, Eleanor Bergstein, created to be that movie. So there's a nope. lot of history there that's true, you know? That's fascinating. You know, what's interesting, uh, you talk about the entertainment uh, aspect and, and the, the stars who came out of this. Uh, it must be a heck of a thing to get a blurb from Mel Brooks uh, for your book as it's coming out. Uh, tell me how that happened. Yeah, you know, my, I guess when I first put the project together and I think I realized that I had something to share and show, I felt that it would just be really exciting if I could pair it up with a really, really like classic Borscht Belt name. So I made my dream list and Mel Brooks was at the top. And um, I guess I'm kind of persistent by nature. Um, and I think I sent like one or two, maybe three emails sharing the work, asking. At first I had asked him to write the essay. I don't think he was interested in that. But when he said he would do the blurb, and also included that he got fired at a hotel for not being funny enough. Um, it was just perfect. And you know what he writes, um, I, uh, I was there in the glory days of the Catskills and the audiences were tough and demanding. They really sharpened your act. It was do or die, no Borschfeld, no Mal Brooks. So, you know, he's basically saying that without this place, he would have just not like, existed in a way or just risen to you know not only the genius and the comedic banter but like who he is Mel Brooks really like an icon of our times so um I almost fell on the floor when he gave me that quote as did my editor at Cornell and um, I'm so appreciative to him and to so many others uh the late Larry King um, phenomenal people, creative artists, uh, Lori Simmons, who's a wonderful photographer who I admire, who did a lot of work in the Catskills when she was younger, and um, a curator from ICP, Maya Benton. And I just was like, let me ask. And they said yes. And it was really wonderful to, to have their words be part of the book. It's interesting. It, it seems to speak to the, the reservoir of goodwill, good memories, again, sort of accumulated joy that so many really prominent figures were so enthusiastic to be a, even a small part of this. So many. And, you know, I just look at my own personal family history and the memories are really what brought my parents up to the Catskills. Um, they had gone up as kids separately, um, but when they met, they lived in Brooklyn and my parents moved up there in around 85 and they're still there today. But the reasons they moved there was because of the memories. And I think that's where you can jog almost anyone who has an experience there. And, you know, I'd say 10 times out of 10, it is a joyful repository of memories um, because it was just so much fun. Um, and um, I think that's why the book um, still kind of has this, um, you know, intrigue to it. Um, in addition to the Catskills, having over the past, you know, four or five years, really reinventing itself more and more. Um, with all of these hotels that I photographed, I'd say in the book, about half of them are gone. So, um, you know, that means that there's not even a ruin, there's not a pool in the middle of the woods, there's not a, an old stone staircase. 
um, you know, time with its passing is really changing the nature of what the Borscht Belt was, both physically and the people that, you know, were part of it, but also the reinvention and the, the changing of the cycle um, and the kind of new looking towards the Catskills as a vacation destination once again. Now that's that's an interesting point. I'd like to uh, sort of circle back to that at the end because it is interesting how the moment that you've captured, just like the moment that preceded it, seems to be very swiftly passing away and being replaced by a, yet another, you call them epics, uh, and maybe we can talk about that a, a bit uh, at, at the end. But what, what's interesting uh, here, because you just brought it up, this is uh, history um, of uh, American culture, it's history of American Jewish identity, but it's also very personal for you. Um, as you point out, uh, you were born in Brooklyn, but, but raised in the Catskills. Uh, and um, both in, in your writing and in your lecturing, as I remember, um, that comes through in a powerful way. And, and I wonder if it's okay to, to ask about this. Tell me what it's like um, the Borscht Belt uh, in its, I guess it was sort of the, the waning years of its heyday, but through the eyes of a kid, because I always find that as an exciting way to experience history. So, so, so you were there, tell me what it's like. That's a great question. And, and I still try to separate it because through the eyes of a kid, I was a seven or eight year old living down the street from the Concord and Kutcher's. And my grandfather, Jack, was a card shark at both hotels. So my grandparents used to go to that hotel. They owned a condo adjacent to Kutcher's. The hotel at one point in the 80s built condos for people that like loved coming up there. So they had a small little condo. And I remember being dropped off with my parents. And um, it only took, you know, like as an adult, it took to thinking back, they were empty. Um, they were totally empty. And it was me and my grandparents. I remember the coffee shop empty, the pool, like a few people in it, um, playing shuffleboard. I remember being, you know, kind of like set free. There was a game room and it had this Indiana Jones game. And I always attribute that game to my interests because I've often called the Borscht Belt like my Indiana Jones project. Because I do feel like an archaeologist in a lot of ways where much of my work is searching for remnants of a former time. Um, but I just remember everything just being just like like a field day, like a field trip at those hotels. But now sitting where I'm sitting, almost 41 years old, you know, those years, the mid 80s into the 90s were really the downfall of those hotels. And, and in the 90s, I worked at the Concord as a lifeguard and most all of them had closed by that point. Mm -hmm. The Concord in 96, um, Grossinger's in 89, even before that, Kutcher's. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting to kind of um, think about when I was a kid, but growing up there through my childhood years, was like joyful. But when I was a teenager, it was evident that the failure of the Borscht Belt, the economic fallout, the cultural fallout, the political issues in the area all became very bigger, much bigger when I was a teenager. So many things that I'm not aware of then, I am aware of now, but you know, why these hotels sat, what was going on, you know, what in the area created that stagnation and why. And, um, you know, I think um, as a teenager, it was really boring growing up there. There was not much open, there was not much to do, and there was a lot of trouble to be gotten into. Um, so one of the things that I find most interesting is some of the images in the book show that repurposing that teenagers at the time were doing, which is taking a showroom that used to have, you know, a, a theater with hundreds of seats and gutting it and turning it into a skate park or taking a dining room and turning it into a paintball battlefield because the realities are is that the towns in that region could not afford a skate park or you know there was not a paintball center open for kids to have fun and play you know this is an area that was you know um just full of tourism and then almost it feels like in the blink of an eye it shuttered so the the fallout as i've mentioned from that is bleak it's interesting. I was going to ask about that. I was wondering if it felt at the time 
like you were living through decline. Uh, and it sounds like maybe at some point you started to notice that, but now looking back, it's clear. Yeah, I think hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, as a teenager, it was like, oh, there was nothing open. The movie theater closed, everything closed. But, you know, I always had a friend that had a car. And when you're growing up in the Catskills or in a rural place, a car is your freedom. That's, that's your outlet to get around. So again, like looking back now, I can kind of look at that um, that visual change and, and really see um, how the area really just dipped for a very long time. Um, but it's really lovely now to see the kind of incline that's happening there as well. And I think it's just the nature of, of time and change and cycles. You know, the Borscht Belt was the third primary, I guess, um, industry that Sullivan County saw. There were two before that. Um, one was the lumber industry and the second was the tanning. But if you look at the cycles of those histories, each kind of lasted for about 30 to 50 years before dying out for a period of time. And that low, that lull always existed. So we've kind of just been living through that since I was a teenager into the early 2000s. But now in 2021, the area known as the Borscht Belt is making New York Times list, Forbes list for the places to go. You know, a Vogue magazine editor has a shop there. So these shuttered towns from my childhood now have lines to get into the restaurants like in New York City, which, you know, it's it's mind blowing. Well, that's that, I mean, it's it's a it's a great update uh, to the story. Um, and what what accounted I mean, you talk a little bit about this uh, for the the end of the old Borscht Belt. Uh, I know that. While. In our own time, we know there's still horrible anti-Semitism in this country, and maybe it's gotten worse in recent years. It, it, it the sort of official discrimination maybe wasn't the same on the one hand, and so that opens up other options. And then it's cheaper to go to Florida, it's cheaper to go to Europe. Like there's there's more other options, um, but there's also you you sort of alluded to political economic conditions in the region. What accounts sort of for the decline of that moment? Yeah, I think um, people always like to say it's one thing. I, I never think anything is one thing. It's neither black or white. Um, the historical perspective is that in 1965, um, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Anti-Discrimination Act. I believe that was January 65. And historians of the Borscht Belt, John Conway, Phil Brown, have tracked that the decline began then because Jews who were once banned from going to certain establishments could now get on a plane, you have the boom of air travel, you can fly to Paris, you can go to Israel, you can go to the wherever you want, the Caribbean. So now you can, uh, you know, move into that airline boom, right, in the 70s and the 80s. Also, the cruise industry boomed then. So seeing five countries in four days. Um, you also have the changing structure of women entering the workforce. I think the 60s was a very um, one of the most impactful decades in American history. You know, you have women's lib, you have um, the Vietnam War, you have the civil rights movement. There are so many things going on, so much change, so much thinking, and the old um, was really highlighted as the old. Um, and this new era of not only opening up doors to people who were previously had them closed, um, but also the Catskills kind of kept it same um, we call it shtick, um, S-H-T-I-K, shtick, like the same acts, the same food, the same stuff. So it got stale. Um, and I know from my own father's experience, you know, he didn't want to go up there for the 15th summer in 1969. He went to Woodstock and he got on a plane to go to Paris, as did almost everyone else. So, you know, that that really contributed to the decline. People love to say it was air conditioning. And yes, you know, um, people escaped New York City and the stifling heat to go up to the Catskills. And the growth and the proliferation of the suburbs also contributed to the Catskills decline, where you move to Long Island or Jersey or Westchester and get yourself a little patch of grass. And now you're not really trekking up there every summer. So it's a multitude I call it the perfect storm um, because it really was so many different things happening at one time to lead to that really decline of that era, that empire. 
Well, you're right that um, for some people, these structures, which we're going to start talking about momentarily, uh, they signify economic stagnation and cultural loss. The remains of the Borscht Belt evoke something great that is no longer. Um, and there are a series of paired photos that open up your book. Can you talk about those sets to start things off and sort of the sense of loss that permeates portions of the work? I know that's not the whole point, as, as you've already implied, but it's certainly there. Um, and talk a bit about that. Yeah, so um, what you're referring to is um, a process um, called re-photography. It's something that photographers have been doing for a long, long time, um, since really the birth of the medium in you know the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. So what I did was um, I took a postcard. Um, there were so much ephemera, so much material, so much printed, um, matter from the Borscht Belt for me to source from. So in the early stages of the project, I began taking uh, postcards that I found and re-photography is basically the act of repeating that image. So you go to the same place that that photographer made that postcard, stand at the same location, same vantage point and recreate that image. So when they're paired together as a diptych, um, you see this intense change um, over time. So I paired an image from 1965, for example, of the Laurel's um, indoor pool, which when I found it in 2011 was outside and it was just the pool. There was no structure around it. The landscape beyond it had changed. Most of the hotel had burned in a fire. Hmm. So I began this now and then series. Um, I thought that was going to be the book. Um, to me, that was the project. And I think just with the nature of like digging into something and working on it, I realized there was much of a story to tell very early on. And those early re-photographic diptychs became the blueprint or the entrance way for the book, which led into the series of just photographs that I made at each different site that weren't that kind of, I call it a treasure map, but it was like a formula, like a now and then. Well, uh, as we talk about uh, the process of, of doing this, which I, I find fascinating and, and I'm, I'm learning about your craft, so, that, so it's exciting for me. Um, as you embarked on this project, there were a lot of complications. A few minutes ago, uh, you alluded to Indiana Jones and uh, some of what you describe uh, climbing into these places and, and sort of uh, avoiding various pitfalls. It, 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 maybe Indiana Jones was, was good preparation for this. Um, talk about some of the complications with safety, with just getting in, with locks, uh, so forth, uh, for, for undertaking this, this project. Yeah, I think before I talk about that, I, 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 the thing that leads it into me uh, for me is, you know, when I started the project, I would get a lot of questioning. Questioning mm -hmm. from not only friends, but family, and even strangers who would say, well, why do you want to go to Grossinger's? There's nothing there why do you want to go to the pines? There's nothing there. Like, okay, I'll go with you, but there's nothing there. And for a long time, I just was like, just come with me. I'm working on this project. It feels like something. I, I just felt like I needed to, um, it, it was this inner kind of gut feeling that was telling me to make this book. Um, and, it, and I couldn't verbalize it at the time. And it took a long time for my answer to say to those who were saying, you know, there's nothing there. Well, you're not looking. Um, because to me, there were these, um, you know, uh, layered kind of still lives that I was making. They were rooted in the past, in the history of the Borscht Belt and all that was. They were kind of like um, drawn together by the present moment and everything that was going on in the hotels. The, the fact that they were decaying, there were squatters, there were people scrapping for metal, um, there was mother nature reclaiming. And then, you know, the future, which was like, well, what's going to happen to these places? So because these places are largely like toxic sites without like getting too into, um, you know, what happens to a structure when you just leave it there for 50 years, um, you know, and the rotting and the decaying and all of that, um, each was owned by someone, um, even though it was abandoned. That's the funny thing about abandoned kind of exploration is people think like they're empty. Well, no, there's always eyes on them. Um, so at first it was a lot of 
like, let me just sneak on. And then I realized that I was kind of up against something different um, when the police would come or a neighbor would call the cops, because again, these eyes are there. Um, and you're kind of naive to think that no one is watching you, you know? So um, permission started to be um, a job in itself where I would show up at the police station with a portfolio of images after they almost threatened to arrest me. Um, I ended up knowing the cop from high school. So that's why I didn't get arrested. But again, like these local connections, these, uh, my dad knew the lawyer that represented the Pines. So I connected with him and he let me on and I would kind of get the silent like wink. Okay, you can go. Um, but always like, why do you want to go there? There's nothing there. Um, so permission was really important because my process with photography and the way that I think photography should be is, is a slow process. It's a contemplative process where you're thinking about what you're making an image of. In the advent of digital, we have this memory card where we can make 500 images in a second and not think about any of them. Um, I'm shooting film and I always shoot film. I still shoot film. And when you have 16 exposures, um, you're a little bit slower by nature because you only have 16 and the cost is high um, to produce. Um, but also, um, you know, the fact that I was in these abandoned places, I didn't want to rush. Um, so I had my medium format camera and my tripod and I need permission because I need to not worry about like, well, who's coming in or who's coming up the driveway, um, possibly kicking me off because I don't want to rush. Um, and the project took five or six years, so I certainly didn't rush. Um, and even the making of one image, I don't think should be like hasty. Um, well, uh, sort of going along with that deliberate process and, and uh, sort of working with your landscape rather than sort of forcing things, um, <clears throat> You say that uh, your role as a photographer was to see, observe, and record. I did not move or adjust anything. Uh, and you also note that what I set out to discover and photograph on any given day was not what I would find. Um, it seems to have been a sort of creative and ultimately productive interplay between your agenda or plan and what was going on and then sort of you responding and observing and, and dealing with that, um, but not abandoning your your vision, right? And, and so how did you strike a balance in that process? Yeah, and I love how you put it like that. I, you know, it was like um, the plan was always at first to just document as many Borschfeldt sites as I could. Find them, the ones I went to as a kid, and the many that I had never heard of or had not gone to. And this included not only the big hotels, but the small ones and the bungalow colonies. So I would just make lists and lists. And, um, you know, after I would make these lists, I would, um, you know, manage to, to just kind of, um, you know, go there. But once I went there, there was all the interplay of everything that was going on at each location. Oh, this one just closed. Oh, this one closed 20 years ago. So navigating each spot always presented something different. For example, Grossinger's. I had made friends with the groundskeeper because at that time the um, golf course was open. So he gave me a tour of the hotel and kind of showed me where to go and where not to go. So the process was that I went back many different times to each location. So this kind of serendipitous or sublime thing would be like, yes, I'm going to Grossinger's in the middle of like a spring morning to photograph what's there, but never did I expect to see a plant growing up to my knees, flowering through some ice and, you know, gleaming in sunlight. You know, that is just things that um, with this type of photography, you're not you only wish that you could find it's like the photo gods or the you know the gems just like kind of like opening themselves up to you um so it's that and those instances of adventure and excitement that kept me going um because to walk into a showroom um and you see the stage and you see the red curtain um that used to rise and fall but then you know you see the room and you see grass growing through and you see you know the the colors of the season and each is so invigorating all of those facets and again it's that past present and kind of the future and they're all kind of working at the same time so I just put myself there 
And I think in putting myself there and investing the time, um, it was like dominoes in a way where like um, the hotels kind of like opened their doors for me as like an invite in a way. Um, and I just kept looking at them and observing them and not ever really constructing images because they were left to chance to the many others that have been going in there, whether they're photographing or skateboarding or moving furniture or stealing furniture or stealing pieces um, or mother nature herself. Um, you know, I call them still lives because they are, you know, created by kind of time and chance. That's, 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 it's really, it comes through so well in, in these photos and, and some of them, maybe I was naive, but, but I, I was surprised. I wonder if you were surprised at how swiftly nature reclaimed some of these abandoned spaces. You've got pictures of buildings uh, that are, you know, you've got trees growing through benches and you've got a stone staircase that looks like it could be ancient ruins and it's completely overgrown. Uh, did that ever surprise you? Yeah, and it still does, you know, like how long would it take for me to kind of leave the house that I'm living in now for, you know, uh, grass to start growing up through, you know, the, the sidewalk outside of my house or, you know, the wood to expand and contrast enough over seasons and weather and conditions. Um, five years, 10 years in this case, um, some of the hotels had been sitting for three years, and I think Grossinger's was sitting the longest since 89, um, up to, you know, 20 or 30. So um, it was um, tragic, but at the same time, surreal and kind of magical to see all of the kind of forces that were beating against these hotels, um, both um, kind of like majestic and beautiful, um, but also, um, you know, the very kind of sad and kind of destructive ones where people would go and, you know, destroy a bowling alley and just take a bat to a bunch of, you know, chairs. Um, the last image in the book is, um, is uh, green bar stools and there's no counter. There used to be a, a counter. It was a coffee shop at Grossinger's. And I made that the last image. I felt like it was poignant to be kind of the end. But um, not long after I made that image, I, I was still shooting. I was still going back to Grossinger's and someone had knocked down all of those chairs. So to me, that's the tragedy. You know, that yes, to some, the tragedy is like the fact that Grossinger's fell to that level of disrepair and, and you know, entropy and decay. But to me, it's like, no, these gorgeous stools, these green, perfect stools were sitting there for 40 years and then someone comes and knocks them down. Um, so, um, but again, those changes always happened. And when people kept saying there's nothing there, I was like, no, like these places are alive. You know, and we think of ruins as kind of inert or like dead, but they're not, you know, and these are modern ruins in America. You know, mostly we think of ruins as thousands of years old where we have to go to, you know, the Middle East and Tibet and far off places. But these are like sitting right here and um, they can tell us a lot. They're obviously melancholy. And I think there's a huge pathos that runs through the project, but I also believe that they're kind of instructive and um, romantic at the same time, ruins in a way. It's, I think that's right. It, it's interesting that um, there are varying stages of decay. And I, I suppose, and I was trying to work through this, I, I don't know the, the timeline as, as well as you do, but you know, some of these places, they might be a little bit disheveled, but it looks like people could have just sort of left the room abruptly five minutes ago, right? I mean, you've got chairs in a sunny room and it, and it looks like a place where you could sit and read a book yes, the, the day before, or there's some bedrooms where the bedroom just looks like they need to, you know, remake the bed. And there are other bedrooms where it's completely covered in moss and, and it's just, um, <sighs> what accounts for that? Is it just timing? Is it uh, time. people it's work? Time. Yeah. yeah. It's time, it's timing, it's what each um, site, let's call them sites, right? The mm -hmm. hotel, the bungalow colonies, the circumstances that have led to that moment 
whether they closed and they reopened or they've been closed for 30 years or they just closed three years ago and there's a groundskeeper kind of maintaining it and the plans are that they want to turn it into something else. For example, I think it's the Neville where the chairs, when I photographed them on this beautiful sunny day under a tent, were like so inviting. It's like, come to the pool. And the pool was filled with water because the hotel had only closed a few years ago. I think they were having conferences there for a while. And the plan was for them to think they wanted to be a casino. And then they had other plans after that got rejected. But nevertheless, now we're talking that was 2011 or 12. Um, or maybe even uh, I started, but I think I wrapped up the project in early 2016 because the book came out in late 2016. So, you know, at that point, you know, now the Neville is like caving in. Um, but in 2011 to 15, it was like intact. So there we go with how long does it take for things um, that are kind of um, neglected to fall apart, you know, like everything does fall apart at some point, you know, structure, body, person, physical place. It, it's kind of the bittersweet reality of, of things. Yeah, in some ways that was sort of humbling uh, as a human to watch sort of what time does to degrade all of these. But then it's just sad because you remember this was a place first of escape from persecution or at least an opportunity to have joy despite persecution and then a place of celebration and fun. And so it's almost like you don't want to go into, well, this shows us that humans are sort of, it's, it's, it's just kind of sad. And, and, uh, yeah. and, and, and it's sad, you know, in the book, there's an essay by Jenna Weissman Jocelyn. She's just phenomenal. I can't say enough about how phenomenal of a person I think she is. Um, and her essay is witty, but it's also eloquent. And, you know, she writes how, like, American Jews are the ones to blame for the Borscht Belt's decline. You know, we gave up on it. We stopped going. So when we lament it and when we cry about it or complain and kvetch about it, it's really our doing. Um, yes, you know, but you also have to put us in the place where we were, we were you know, kind of banned from doing so much. So now we want to go and we want to explore the wild world. But, you know, um, I think she wrote, American Jews came of age in the Borscht Belt. And it, it really was true. You know, they're kind of coming as immigrants to this country, facing persecution in Eastern Europe, uh, the dawn of the Holocaust, the Holocaust itself, and then the 1950s ushering in this period of prosperity, of joy, um, of kind of like, again, that American dream. And then the 60s just turning the tables on everything and then everyone kind of abandoning it. And that's why some of the images really do look like the pots and pans are stacked and the laundries in baskets because the hotels in some cases just closed um, and it feels apocalyptic you know um, almost like many of the images we saw early in the pandemic where people were just like on empty streets um, you know or in restaurants with like saucers stacked you know for the people that were there yesterday it was very similar like with the Borscht Belt in that sense like you know um, with the way the images look in certain situations. That was actually something I really wanted to ask you about, so I'm glad you brought that up. Some of these look as though either they didn't know they weren't coming back or they're planning to come back very soon. Uh, whether it's people took the time to go and board up windows so, you know, maybe this will be safer and preserved, or there are some where, as you say, there are plates stacked, there are places, uh, there's this one room where there's just a a room full of like lounge chairs, like poolside lounge chairs that are all stacked nicely. I mean, you know, punk kids wouldn't go in and just sort of stack them nicely. They'd throw them around and tear them up, right? And so somebody did that. Somebody thought they were coming back. I'm curious about those those photos. They are very apocalyptic, you're right about that. Yeah, it was another theme, you know? Like there was a lot of themes I think I found in this project. Like first was the sheer abandonment and the entropy, um, but then was that apocalyptic um, quality to what felt like just a shuttering, a closing, and like a bunch of lawn chairs just waiting maybe for the next season if someone would come along. You know, the thing about the Catskills is it was always like the Catskills are going to come back, they're going to come back. That was kind of the, the sentiment throughout my entire childhood. Often the answer was going to be the casinos that were like the grand messiah that was going to save the Catskills. And it took until what, 2019 for a casino to open. Um, and although I think the casino is great in its right of kind of like employment, 
and a beautiful place where you can go and have a night out and stuff. I think that the Catskills really will continue to draw people and is drawing people again because of its beauty. And that's really why American Jews went up there. It's why, um, you know, um, in the early 1900s and the late 1800s, you have artists and writers and fishermen and lovers of nature. You know, they're going up there for the, really the, the atmosphere, the landscape, what that landscape does. And, you know, I, I think about the Catskills a lot it's a big source of inspiration. It's something that I'm looking to for a new project I'm working on. Although it's not Borscht Belt history, it's other histories. Um, but there's something about that landscape that's magical. And um, there's something special about it. And often people, you know, my husband told me, it's cause you're from there, you know? And I don't think so. Um, yes, that's partially the truth. But there's something about the Catskills, if you look at its history, it has always been a welcoming place to so many different groups of people. So many groups of people that were, besides Jews, that were shunned or persecuted or ostracized. And there's different pockets of the Catskills that cater to different groups. Um, and if you look at it, even though those groups were segregated, they went to this kind of place that allowed them to just be themselves. And I think that that's what the Catskills is. It's like this freedom for all. And it, there's something so peaceful and relaxing. Um, it also has a great location, right? It's super close to New York City. It's accessible um, in the East Coast by car. Um, but um, there's just something so magical about that place. And I think um, all groups of people that have gone have found it. Um, and I'll, if you want to go up and check out a casino, you know, just be sure to like, drive down the street to just see that view um, because um, that's really where the magic of, of that experience is for me at least in the Catskills. Well, I think it's I think it's beautifully put and I, I and generations of American artists have I mean it really some of the, the the roots of American art right are coming both literature uh, with uh, people like uh, Washington Irving uh, and uh, visual arts with the, I mean, a lot of the Hudson River school people are sort of looking yeah. like I mean, icons of American landscape yeah. in that Hudson River school. I show um, Asher Duran's Kindred Spirits, um, which shows Ka the Catterskill or Catskill Falls. You know, it's these two men contemplating nature at the edge of this huge boulder. And it has all these little icons and memento mori and really interesting things to decipher from the painting. You can, you can just spend like an hours in it. But that, that is the Catskills, you know, this kind of um, serene, pristine land that has drawn and inspired and almost kind of taken in so many people. Yeah. I wonder if I can ask about a couple of specific uh, photos that jumped out at me and see what they mean. I, and I guess I'll start. Uh, we won't judge a book by a cover, but we will praise a book for its cover. Uh, this is a remarkable photo. Um, tell me about this one and why this was the one that ended up on the front. Yeah, like for me, like a photograph, when it's a photograph, like a good photograph, that means, I guess, in a nutshell, that it has technically everything working for it, it like the exposure, everything is right. Um, also, the composition is solid, but then there's this like gut feeling. It like punches you somewhere between the stomach and the heart and the brain, and it's just like, yes, like that's it. When I saw that image, like it was, I knew that it was the cover for the book. It symbolized the vanished world, that, that place that is no longer. It showed the paradise, the vacation aspect, the recreation and the relaxing component of the Borscht Belt. But then around it was the moss that had grown and the structure that was still there. Um, and I felt like it was it. And there was never even a question uh, of what the cover was gonna be. Um, the back cover was the question, although it was another photograph that I'm so happy with. Um, you know, this unmade bed. Again, I don't, I don't construct any images. Everything is as I find it. Um, it's really against my photographic religion, but this unmade bed and the phone off the hook and, you know, mother nature kind of creeping in and then this just like utter blackness here and that blue. Um, that, that one, we kind of, you know, that was another one where I, I loved it. But um, the front um, really just, um, that was it for me and how pristine this chair is. Um, like, like no one's, you know, no one's sat in it in 40 years, but it, it looks perfect, you know, so certain images just like punched me in the face, like, 
like in that case and i was like okay that's it that works it's it's, it's a wonderful choice and and you know it, I, I, to me, the colors jump out right away from the, from the chair. And it's, it's um, there's a picture of an empty stage and you've talked about all of the generations of world renowned performers who made it uh, in the Catskills or didn't make it in the Catskills, but it, the Catskills made them. Um, yeah. did, did that one strike you as something sort of very historic or? What was yeah, I think like with the stage of, you know, I wanted to kind of just show um, in the book enough images that really kind of like showed you the Borscht as it was experienced from the stages to the shuffleboard courts to the indoor pools, the outdoor pools, the lobbies, the guest rooms. So I guess my method and the method to the madness was like I was focused on exterior and interior views and really bringing people through the spaces. Um, but also how those spaces contributed to the overarching umbrella of like that quintessential Borschtfeld experience, which was a dining room, a lobby, a pool, um, you know, a lawn chair. Um, and, and then there just happens to be other things that showed up that ended up in the book. Like there's a prayer book that I found just open to a particular passage in the Bible that I had a rabbi translate for me. I thought it was like a message. Um, you know, and then there's ice skates and checks, like literally checks from the hotel, like in the office, just kind of these um, discarded objects. Um, and um, those, you know, those kind of found their way in the book. Um, but really, like the formula was to just like, as much as I could find of the place where the Borscht Belt happened, and then really just editing, editing and editing and really looking at it um, so that I wasn't redundant. Um, so that each image wasn't solely about decay. Um, and so there was a mix of images that touched on different notes, if you will. Um, and that was kind of like the, 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 pro the process. Um, and besides my editor at Cornell that I work with, I, um, I had two consultants, Arthur Ullman, who I consider a mentor. Um, he started the Museum of Photographic Arts and he's a photographer and a professor. So, you know, he helped um, in the layout as did a, a very trusted friend of mine named Walter Brisky Jr. Um, you know, and it was just that, you know, getting that story and piecing it together so it works as a book. I was, I was actually going to ask you about the prayer book because I, I found that one uh, very uh, just so, sort of impactful. Um, and another one I was going to ask you about actually uh, was the there's the cards and there's chips around it. And in the essay, and you've mentioned it here, you talk about being by your grandfather's side as he was playing cards. And I was wondering if that one sort of brought back any particular memories for you or what it spoke to as a photographer. Yeah, that, that was like an homage to him. Um, you know, I, I, I've always said like with the project that I proceeded with like that, I had that plan, you know, that, that intellect that was driving and the idea and like, okay, you know, here I'm gonna go. Um, but then I would get tripped up on my own emotions because Kutcher's where I made that image of the cards or the Concord, I, I don't remember quite where that one was made. I think it, I think it was Kutcher's. But, um, you know, I'd go to that hotel and I'd see the pool table that I learned how to play pool on um, and it would just kind of like floor me because you know all of that kind of like left side of the uh, right side of the brain kind of intellect would just like spill into like a bucket of tears driving on the way home because my grandfather is no longer around and even you know in recent weeks I lost both of my grandmothers who are also a part of this book so um you know the project actually the book has become sadder for me in recent times than it ever has been yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry for your losses. Oh, I, uh... yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, um, that postcard or sorry, the, the chips, the poker chips and the cards, that was for him. That was for my card chart grandpa. And, um, you know, other images of one of the shuffleboard courts at the Paramount, you know, I didn't learn how to play shuffleboard there, but um, the, that was like a symbol for me of my childhood. So um, the book is personal because it has these personal stories um, that I bring to it, but it's collective because there are, I don't know, millions, but thousands of people who have very similar stories. 
you know, where their families met there and their grandparents went and they went on vacation and they have these scrapbooks of photographs. And um, it really is like this experience um, for those who are fortunate and lucky to, to live it um, that is embedded in their, in their like tapestry of their family, you know? Um, there's a lot of pools in the so. book. <laughs> and I guess part of that is there were a lot of pools in the Borscht Belt, and part of it maybe is that's a big part of that experience. I know you said you were lifeguards as part of your experience, but um, they're in varying states as well. Uh, did, did you, was there a strategy when it came to the pools? Because they're all over the place in this book. Yeah, so the pools <laughs> were like, um, so so if you think about like, uh, there were 538 hotels, so say historians, I think more. Um, the, the number is probably more and 50,000 bungalows, um, little kind of cabins. So um, each hotel probably had some size of a pool. Some had two pools, some had Olympic size pools, some had just regular size, like, you know, a pool that one might like have if they have a pool like in their yard. Um, but when so many of the hotels shuttered and closed in the 80s and 90s and either burned down or knocked down, the pools were the things that were left because they're the most difficult to unearth and dig up. So they would just knock down the whole structure. And then if you walk a little bit further into the woods that it's now become, you'll find a pool. Um, so, you know, pools are a symbol of, of vacation and of leisure. And in the book, um, going back to Jenna, she writes, um, part of her essay is just about chairs at pools and like what pools were. Um, you know, so, um, so many pools, I could have probably made a book of just the pools. Um, and there were pools that didn't even end up in, in the book. Um, but I think there are in abundance because they are the kind of structures that are the most difficult to tear down and eradicate. Hmm. Uh, well, it's, that, that's another thing that I, I want to ask about, which is um, watching things get destroyed by nature. And, and we've talked about this a bit already, but you very intentionally used the seasons as an artist. And the to me, the summer pictures and the, the, I guess the springtime pictures were sort of terrifying and humiliating as a human because it's like, look, nature's just going to destroy whatever we do. And it's, oh gosh. Um, but then the winter ones were their own kind of, because it's just like, there's nothing. It's just it's this blanket of white. It's not like there's alternative life to humans. It's just silence. And um, what was your strategy in the use of the seasons? And, and you're the artist here. What, what did they convey to you? Yeah, well, I think, you know, growing up in that area, my parents had been there since I was five or six. The seasons were such a big part of my experience. Um, you know, what the summer brings and the fall and the winter. Um, and then looking at that approach as a photographer, the seasons were also like, the Borschfeld was primarily a, a summer destination, but the hotels were open year round. So that there was like, I wanna capture them year round, but more importantly were the colors and the textures that each season brought. You know, uh, spring brings renewal, brings, you know, a lot of green and flowering and the summer brings like the peak of the grasses and the colors and this, you know, that summer light. But moving into fall, there's something beautiful and quiet. And then winter has, you know, the white of snow and often like the really blue sky, if you can get that on a winter day. And then there are gray cloudy days. Um, so all of the seasons kind of provided um, like it amplified, I think for me, the backdrops or, or, you know, where, you know, I just was working with, I had more to work with because I used, it incorporated that into, you know, well, here I'm at the outdoor pool. So I'm going to go in the summer where it kind of looks like it fits, but then, you know, here's a pool in the middle of winter and someone threw a sink into it and a bunch of chairs and there's like ice growing up. Um, and, um, it really just gave my eye something different to look at because I didn't want the whole book to just be like green, you know, uh, and like about the, the kind of the summer. It needed to have those different elements, you know, of winter just making like an ice skating rink look like super cold, you know? Uh, no, it, well, it worked very nicely, I thought. And um, I 
there's something about the sort of skeletal way the trees look against that bright blue sky or even the dark sky uh, in the winter time that's just really just to me very compelling. So I, I, I love that as a background for what you're presenting. It, it really worked to frame it very nicely. I, so, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, also like the reality was is I was working on the project for like five or six years. So I was working like full time at the time at, an, at a nonprofit and in grad school for some of it. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, in the tail end of it, I had been living in Westchester at that point and still trekking up there. So it was like, whenever I had time, um, I would go and photograph. So I would just make sure that I would, you know, it, time happens whenever, you know, you have it. So it was like, I go in the summer, I have a fall kind of couple weeks up there. I have a few weeks in the winter and, and it just worked when I put everything together. There are, there are a few places where there's a clear uh, evidence of sort of the children's presence there and, and usually things that would convey a future and, and promise, right? And, and instead, they're just sort of part of this abandonment. I'm thinking that in one of the dozens of pools, uh, there's like a kid's like toy truck or something sort of just sitting there half in the mud. I remember there's a wooden swing that's kind of starting to fall apart. Um, did those images, I, I think maybe some of the ice skates, I couldn't tell the size, but uh, yeah. did those images in particular sort of jump out? Uh, you know, those images are interesting because, um, you know, the one where like the truck is coming out of the pool, you know, it felt like there were multiple different narratives that could have been there, you know, um, like a loss of childhood. It, it, it felt like almost like some of them felt like crime scenes in a way. Like it just, it, it was, I debated putting that one in, but I loved um, the image as a whole, um, the reflection on the pool and how you were looking into the pool. But yeah, you know, the swings, um, I guess, you know, when I looked at it, it was kind of more about my childhood that was in that pro process, you know, and kind of going back to places when I, where I was when I was a kid. So finding those kind of quintessential like childhood um toys or experiences like a bike um you know or swings um just kind of like added another layer um as did so many people that went there during their childhoods and like went to camp or went on the swings you know so it was just another narrative um and I think those are like the two images the ice skates are adult ice skates I'm pretty sure um but you know it's just kind of showing I guess the the gamut of like who went there, you know, kids, adults, people in their 80s, I know everyone found something there, you know. One thing that's interesting for me as I was looking at these, even though I never experienced uh, these places, um, there was something uh, that spoke to my youth anyway, and I think probably people from our generation uh, anyway, and that is the sort of colors, the design of the furniture that remained, uh, I think it's mid-century modern, right? The sort of, the angles of the ice skating rink, uh, one of the two, uh, just the way it's built, it looks like things that were built before our time, but that we as little kids were growing up around. And a lot of that stuff doesn't, things don't look that way anymore. And we sort of miss that. And I was feeling uh, sort of, uh, I was feeling lost and, and wistful for this world that I never even experienced because it was a sort of architectural and design style that seemed just universal mid 20th century. Um, did that speak to you or am I just sort of thinking? Oh, oh well, 100%. <laughs> well, you know, like, when those structures were built, they were built by like the the greatest architects of those days in the mid-century modern kind of time period of the 50s and 60s. And um, they are like magnificent. Um, you know, the, the pools and the lobbies and the detail and, you know, just the style itself. And I also think that for you and I, and for many people, there's like, a, there's a nostalgia in that style. There's also a, a kind of return to that style because it's a coveted aesthetic, that mid-century aesthetic for so many people nowadays, um, whether it's in their homes or a lamp or like a restaurant that adopts that aesthetic. So I think there's something that's very classic and classy about that aesthetic. And I, I don't believe that it will ever fade away. I think you're, it's, it's inter interesting when you said before that uh, there was a generation that sort of found the Porsche belts stick to be sort of passe. 
uh, and probably the entire aesthetic was passe to them. Yeah. And I think people who just were little kids as it was fading away were like, no, we kind of liked that. We'd like it back. Um, well, the nature of everything changed after then, you know, like the world kind of got faster and um, everything was quick. And, and I think we're still living in that, which is why I think another reason why the Catskills is becoming a destination again, because it offers that experience that maybe people want again. You know, um, with, the, with the pandemic, I think people, the nature of travel is gonna change. So I think people are more apt to get in their cars and drive. Um, also have that quiet, kind of like, you know, like get a little house, get a little room, sit out, have a barbecue, watch the time go by, have a drink, you know, in the summer. Um, and I think that that's, that experience is what people want, um, you know, coming off of the tail of like, just this technological, very quick, high paced world that we've been living in for a long time. I think that the model of the Borscht Belt and that, that leisurely aesthetic that they, that they offered, um, you know, is something that will and is becoming appealing again. I think that, I think you're right about that. Uh, it, it's interesting. You've said a couple of times that even since this book came out, which wasn't that long ago, 2016, although that feels like a very it long time. Like yeah. I mean, so much has <laughs> happened in my life since as every, everyone's life in that period of time, but um, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, it's okay. It's just, I, I the, the premise of the question was, I suppose, false because 2016 until now has been probably the longest five years in, in many of our lifetimes, but nevertheless, um, it, since then, a lot has changed, as you've pointed out, in the cat skills. And it's interesting to me because you wrote uh, in, the, in your essay that while the photographs I've made contain a sense of pathos for what was, I see most clearly in them the traces of hope, growth, and possibility. And on the one hand, you have here lamented that in the meantime, people have gone and destroyed a lot of what you've taken photos of. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you seem bullish on the Catskills again. So uh, talk about the hope, growth, and possibility that you were referring to at the time. Yeah. I think it's probably different than the casino, but yeah. you know how that fits into these cycles you've described. Yeah, um, it was fine that lines be like, I, I left it in and I loved it because it was true, even though I feel like it's cheesy, like hope, growth, and possibility. I kind of laugh at my writing sometimes, but um when I sat down to really like put the book together um, and um, along the process of making the images, um, I not only looked at the history of the Borscht Belt in that chronological time span of it, but I looked at the previous histories that I touched on briefly. The lumber industry coming out of the mid to late 1800s, the tanning industry, um, you know, leading into like the Civil War and the years afterwards and then the slumps in between each um, boom. So my theory and my thesis was always, well, the Catskills is going to become something again. Um, it never is going to be what it was because you can never like recreate a moment of the past and have it be that same great moment. You can try and we've always tried to like recreate things. Um, but my thesis was always like, well, look at the lumber industry that rose and died out, the tanning industry, and then the Borscht Belt. Um, so there was always going to be this like up again, if you look historically, like history does tend to repeat itself for better or worse. So hope, growth, and possibility was really um, the revelation and the realization that many of the structures that I was photographing were going to be no longer eventually five years later, half of them are completely gone, meaning not even like that pool, those pools are gone. People have gone in and like knocked those down too. So hope was um, my hope for a reinvention, uh, a new life to that former um, kind of, you know, era of the Borscht Belt, something new, a new chapter, growth, which was going to be growth for the county um, and, and possibility, you know, which was just like, the vast possibilities that the Catskills can offer. So it was really like pointing towards, um, pointing away from the sadness and the melancholy um, and the bittersweet quality of like that everything does have an ending, but 
you know, rephrasing that or reframing it and like looking to like kind of glass is half full, like positive um, look outlook at, at change as difficult as it can be. Um, and that in that change, even though it's going to look different and does look completely different, you know, there is so much potential. Um, you know, so that, that was kind of the hope, growth and possibility kind of fun. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, and I don't think the writing is uh, in any way uh, cheesy or anything. I thought it was beautifully put. Um, it, and it works today. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, there's one thing I, I should have mentioned earlier, but parenthetically, you know, when I've been doing research, you know, for, for the first book, it was many, you know, I'd go weeks at a time on the road. I'd come back on the weekends, see my family, and my daughter was very small at the time. You know, I don't want to miss anything, and then go off yeah. for a week and then come home, and you're lonely on the road. And, and I remember uh, thinking, boy, I wish I were a photographer because looking down an empty hotel hallway corridor is just such a bleak, lonely thing to see. And you have a photo in there of one of those, except it's the, the doors are gone. It says, um, I was wondering, that spoke to some of my own uh, memories in a sort of weird way, but I'm wondering if that had an effect on you as an artist. Yeah. Oh, that I love that image. That's like, I call that my like Stanley Kubrick homage because it's like has a spooky haunting quality where all the doors were off, right? So they were all open that someone like, again, came in and just removed all the doors. So for me going in in the middle of the day, you get all that beautiful light coming in. So I just set up my tripod and, um, you know, made a very long exposure. Um, but yeah, you know, there, <laughs> that image was bleak, but it's also beautiful. I love like the, um, the the uh, the wallpaper, um, but yeah, you know, looking at a lot of the images now, there is you know there's this loneliness in it all, and you you know like I guess you're resonating with the loneliness that you felt, you know, like coming out of a hotel room, being away from your family, and um, you know I'm I'm glad that there's some way that you're connecting with the book, and I appreciate you know anyone's kind of connection to it because um, I always say that it it's a labor of love. Um, about the land that I love. And um, I think whether people kind of lived it, they can kind of revisit it through the book um, or people that didn't know about it, you know, they maybe they have an experience, a vacation, a childhood, a, a place that they went to that's no longer, that can kind of like resonate with them in that manner. Well, I mean, for me, again, it's, this isn't, you know, a, a world that I experienced it. And yet so much of it as art resonated with other, you know, similar or analogous emotions or experiences. But then as history, as archeology, span as recovery, as documentation that you did, I think it then made me curious and want to know more. So I think it worked on multiple levels, whether one had experienced it or not, because you could help us feel something akin to what you're feeling through the art. Uh, we can, you know, if, if I haven't been there, I can't, oh, I remember what this pool table was like. I, I can't do that, but I can, I've been lonely or I've felt lost, but then I can learn about this world intrigued by what you've presented. So I thought it just, it was a fabulous uh, work of history and art in, in my view. Uh, and clearly by all of the praise it's gotten, I'm not alone in that. Um, I wonder, is there a photo or a set of photos in this collection that speaks most to uh, Marissa Scheinfeld's uh, cat skills. Uh, like the cat skills that I remember. Yeah, your your uh, world. Is there a photo that speaks to that? I guess like um, mm, there's one of Kutcher's, um, but it doesn't really speak. It, it, it's complicated because it's like of Kutcher's when it was being demolished, and I remember like being in those buildings as a kid, but it, there's like a flood around it because it had rained and it almost looks like there was a hurricane there. There's so much water. Um, so a lot of them do speak to my experience as a, as a kid. Um, there's another at the Concord where uh, it was being torn down and there's just rubble and like wires and metal, but I managed to get into the frame the only thing that I remember that was it was remaining was the pine trees that lined this driveway where you drove into the Concord. There was these like pine trees stacked after stack. So it's it's those there are fragments of like 
my memories are in some of the photographs like that. Same thing with the shuffleboard court. Like I remember playing shuffleboard with my grandpa and it wasn't a court that I played on. I think that court had been destroyed, um, but it was just me kind of imbuing my memory with the documentation. That's great. Um, you've shared with me a bit about, and you've mentioned it in passing, your next project, which is called uh, Once Upon a Time, and you're dealing with the region, the Hudson Valley uh, in particular. Um, tell us a bit about that project. Oops, something just fell sure, yeah. <laughs> um, It's still a work in progress, and I have a lot of work to do with it. Um, I think just like any project, like you get excited about it and then you worry if it's total, I can't curse on this podcast, so I'll just say like shit. Um, or, you know, then you get back and you're excited and you see some film, but the concept is Once Upon a Time and it draws from the fairy tale preamble of like these stories, these um, histories, fact, fiction, it could be a little bit of everything, a little bit of urban legend, tall tale, um, that are around the Catskills and Hudson Valley region. And some of them are passed down uh, stories, uh, some of them are true, some of them are undocumented, so they're kind of like, uh, you know, debatable. Um, and then others are just histories um, that I've been finding about that I think are interesting to call attention to. Um, and I think the nature of my work is that I look at the landscape in which I live, the Borscht Belt, I looked at the landscape of my childhood. And, you know, now I'm looking at the landscape in Westchester and the Hudson Valley where I live, and also up to the Catskills where I still have a connection. So I'm looking at these other histories, um, anything from unmarked sites of the Underground Railroad to towns that were destroyed by the state or government, um, to um, like uh, down the street where I live now um, is um, where the big book was written, like the tenants of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't know that for about five years and it's right around the corner. Um, so it's like finding out about these interesting histories. And, you know, in that case, um, you know, a, a book that has helped and, and kind of changed and saved the lives of so many people and photographing the desk where that was written. And that's a historic site in itself. So um, other sites um, up in the Catskills, there was a vacation destination for the African-American community that was also destroyed um, in the 80s by New York State, apparently. So I'm looking into kind of other histories um, um, of the land um, and um, ones that maybe aren't as visible or apparent when you drive by, but if you do a little digging, um, maybe something um, that we should pay attention to kind of comes up. Um, and um, whether it was people that were kind of, again, like with Luxton Lake, this African-American community, like in a, a, an act of racism, that community was destroyed, or the, um, the kind of recovery community that also ha often has a stigma on them. Um, I'm trying to get into a, a hotel, well, it's now a private house that was for cross-dressers in the Catskills. Um, so just kind of like putting together these stories of the land. There's also castles. It sounds all over the place when I talk about it because it really is all over the place. Um, but I've been um, conceptualizing it for a little bit of time and this past spring I've been shooting a lot. Um, but I have a lot of work to do. Um, but it's going to be these stories from the, the whole Hudson Valley to the Catskills um, in, via photographs and texts that I think are important to tell. Well, it sounds fascinating. And I hope that um, as it comes together, um, we'll hear more about it. I'd love to have you yeah, back I on. Mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, wonderful. It eventually comes out. You know, I, I have a toddler. He's two. Um, and I love, he's just such a joy, but you know, it's, it's hard. Um, and, and, you know, with the pandemic kind of keeping us home, um, but sometime, you know, in like last winter, I kind of like got off of my butt and said, all right, I really got to work on this. Cause I had the idea. Now it's just, just like the Borscht Belt, spending time with it, really just like letting it unfold, being patient with it, um, and not rushing and feeling like, oh, I got to make another book. Well, I, I do, but I have to give it that same love and time that I gave to the first book. Um, and um, because I, I want it to be good, you know, so um, I would love to talk to you about it when 
when I get further into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I look forward to that. And, and in the meantime, uh, I am so grateful, Marissa, for your generosity of time and for your uh, wonderful work, which uh, if you haven't seen it yet, here it is. Go to, uh, I guess, Cornell Press or I'm sure Amazon uh, and get yourself a copy because it's wonderful. Usually I mark up the books, but obviously this one uh, is completely, you know, I, I couldn't bring myself. So I just put little tags for our conversation. But uh, it, it's, it's a work of art and history, and it is uh, wonderfully put together again from Cornell Press. And so thank you so much, Marissa, for your thank time. Thank you so much for having me on. And um, I really appreciate your interest in the project and, you know, and even my new stuff, which is like all over the place. But thank you so much. It was a pleasure.